Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Eric Doyle and welcome to OGV Energy Live, our interactive live stream show, which is all about bringing you the latest news and insight from the energy sector by bringing to life the UK's leading energy industry publication, OGV Energy Magazine. Each month we bring you features, interviews and discussions with our partners from the publication and across industry to update you all on all the very latest news and opinions with our fully interactive platform. So don't be shy with your questions and comments throughout the show and I'll try and pick out as many as I can to put to our guests. This month is all about digital transformation. That's the theme of the magazine, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to be welcoming guests and contributors who featured in the publication, as well as our support and partners in the sector. Remember, this show is all about you. And as some people are already doing, hi, and we'll, we'll give everybody a little shout out in a second. Uh, this show is all about you. Tell us where you are in the world. Tell us what you do and who you work with. Your marketing department, your leadership team will love it. Free advertising. Throughout the show, you can comment and ask questions of our guests, and we ask you to do so. I'll be keeping an eye out for those, and the production team, hiding in the wings, are going to be looking for the best, most insightful, most interesting question of the day. They're going to select a winner, and that person wins a free half-page advert or article in a future edition of the magazine. So dig deep, keep those comments and questions coming, uh, and, uh, and and make sure we, uh, we put some good stuff to our guests. Um, on this edition of OGV Energy Live, we're delighted to welcome Paula Doyle from Acker BP, Greg Anderson from SOAR Group, and Karen O'Hanlon from Opportunity Northeast as our headline guests. We're then going to move into our industry spotlight section, um, which this month we have Paul George from TAP, Richard Thompson from Imrand, and Gregor Deans from Future On. Before we go into our Market Watch segment, where we're going to get all the latest news and insight on projects and rig hires and all of that from Westwood Global Energy Group and the Energy Industry Council. And we're really excited to end the show. We're thrilled to welcome Steve Roberts, the Interim Head of Offshore Technology 4.0 at the Net Zero Technology Centre. Steve helped set up the Digital, Digital Solutions Centre in 2017 and will be talking to us about some important recommendations that have made following the issue of a recent report as well as some new initiatives that will be of interest to all of you in the supply chain. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that later in the show. I'm just going to say hello to some people before we start, if that's okay. Um, and if um, look at the example that Graham set. Hi to Graham Dallas. Uh, Lucinda's here. Hi, Lucinda. Um, Eleanor, good to have you with us. Uh, Abdul, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm, I, can't, I don't have time to do everyone. Hi, Beth Alexander. Hi, Nur Nurhan. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, tell us where you are. Tell us what you do for a living and tell us who you work with. Um, hi, David Taylor, and hi, Beth. Thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to a great show, and remember to keep those questions and comments coming in. So, digital transformation, what is it? Well, one definition would be that digital transformation is the strategic adoption of digital technologies to create new or modify existing business processes, cultures, or customers' experience to make changes in business and market requirements. Essentially, it's the reimagining of business in a digital age. It's used to improve processes and productivity, and you'll no doubt be seeing all of this in your own industries and your own companies. Deliver better customer and employee experiences, manage business risks, control costs, everything. It could be argued that to remain competitive in the modern business landscape, digital transformation is a commercial necessity. In every case, though, starting a digital transformation journey requires a new mindset, new thinking. It's a chance to reimagine how companies and sectors do things, often from the ground up. To explore this in more detail, we're going to welcome some people who are at the sharp end, at the cutting edge of digital transformation. Our headliners today, Paula Doyle from Acker BP, Greg Anderson, CTO at Sword Group, uh, and Karen O'Hanlon, Director of Digital Technologies at Opportunity Northeast. We're just going to bring our guests on just now. Paula, welcome. Good to have you. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Greg, good to have you with us. Yep, likewise. Thanks for having me along. Oh, fantastic. Great stuff. And Karen, how are you? Very well. Afternoon, everybody. Great stuff. Good to have you all with us. Um, uh, how's everybody doing today? Is it um, has it been digitally challenging to get here, or has it been fairly seamless? Fairly seamless. <laughs> fairly seamless. Says, says the person that just ran in from another meeting and sat down and clicked connect. I love it. Absolutely brilliant. Paula, if it's okay with you, um, can we start with you? Is that fine? Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Three months ago, we saw you announce your new role at Acker BP. Um, how have the first three months been? 
Oh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Um, to be honest, I was very excited about uh, joining AkaBP, just in terms of like the level of ambition that AkaBP has with the digital transformation. Um, and also just, I think that the oil and gas industry is very interesting um, right now. So I had very high expectations joining um, and it's been far exceeded. So it's just been a wonderful kind of, it's th three months since I started, two months really in the job. Um, and it's just been an absolutely fantastic time. Super curious people, open organization, high level of ambition. And also, I think a lot of lessons learned. So AkaBP kind of moving forward is really starting from a, a point of really knowing what works and what doesn't work. And I think that that's just uh, super, super fun. Absolutely fantastic. And I guess even the fact that we're now seeing chief digital officers in energy service companies is quite a step forward, right? Yes, it is. And I think we like I've kind of been in this industry now, you know, digital data, oil and gas uh, the last years, and I'm really seeing it come forward in leaps and bounds. So even the conversation around data, around digital, it's much more around like how we do it, not if we do it and kind of the understanding of the need to have your your data in order, your architecture in order. And I think also most importantly, the focus on value. I really like how you said uh, reimagining business in the digital age. I think that's spot on as to as to what it is and what we need to do very good very good i need to ask you if you follow paula on uh, on linkedin you will see hashtag rebel with a cause on t-shirts you'll see it on posts it's fantastic what is that all about so that is really um we we want to lead the transformation of emp and what we think in akvp is one of the most important things to do there it's really around increasing productivity so this is the productivity revolution um and we think that we uh we do take a rebellious uh, stance in terms of how we want uh the industry to transform how we want digital uh first and center um but of course we also think that we have a very important cause you know so as a pure play emp company the ability to supply uh, oil and gas to the market um, as sustainably as possible. So with the lowest uh, carbon footprint and, and also with the lowest cost is going to be really key for us. So this is something that we really strongly um, believe in and we, we we really want to do it our way um, as well. So we're, super, yeah, we're excited about where we're going. You can tell, you can tell there's an energy, there's definitely an energy about it. What is the what is so you you you've come in in this new role. What's the what's the sort of overarching digital transformation ambition level within Acker BP right now? So it's 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 very high. I mean, our ambition is to be the world's first data driven oil and gas company. So we we're very kind of clear on that. We want to take a poll position in the industry, but not just for ourselves. So we want to lead the transformation of EMP. So we want to we want to really drive it forward, but we also want to share and collaborate with both the EMP industry and also with other industries too. I think that's always been a very kind of fundamental part of AkaBP's philosophy, which is to be open and collaborative with the industry peers. Um, and I think that level of ambition is is super high. And then everything that we're doing now, um, you know, in terms of becoming the world's first data-driven oil and gas company it's really the why would you do that you know so yeah. for us it's really around like using data well that was a great story up until <laughs> that was a great story come back paula doyle come back um maybe that was just a very difficult question and she decided it was time to uh time to duck out why don't we move on to you greg and see if we can get paula back could be one of those things where the uh where the old internet's dropped out or the battery level got low in the computer so greg um thanks for thanks for jumping you were settling back there thinking oh i've got a good <laughs> yeah, I've got a good couple of life. <laughs> for those that don't know you're the cto at sword group what's uh what area of business is sword in just for those that don't know uh, so, for fundamentally, we are uh, a services provider uh, within the technology space. So, we work predominantly across three main markets. So, a lot of the work we do is in oil and gas, um, based up in Aberdeen. But we also do a lot of work in financial services and, and public sector as well. So, personally, I come from a, a development and data background. So, did computer science at university. Been in SOG Group now for about 12 years. Um, and really, I've been working through that whole journey as organizations have started to understand what they need to do to modernize, as well as what the opportunities are around digital transformation. So we're very much a, a, a partner enabling people 
to actually realise those opportunities, ambitions as part of digital transformation. And that's what we do. Very good. So not only are you at the cutting edge of that side of the industry, but you're the chief technology officer, right? So even more pressure on your shoulders. Um, yep. From a technology professional's perspective, uh, a modern CTO, what does digital transformation really mean to you at the core? Well, I think everyone will probably agree that digital transformation has been used for the last few years in lots of conversations, <laughs> some things where it makes sense, others where it's quite hard to understand what people are really meaning by it. So you could probably label it as a lot of different things, but for me, what I felt was really important for us as an organization was to define what we think it is, therefore how we can help. So from a business perspective, and, and Paula touched on it, really for me, it's about how are we helping organizations become more data driven. So what do I mean by that? Everyone can run their businesses and often you make decisions that are based on your gut feeling or some idea of what the, the right answer should be. But being data driven means looking at how do you actually either capture or utilize the data that you've got to really run your business based on facts and based on data that gives you the right insight. So from a business perspective, I think everybody's probably clear on an agreement that data driven is probably the outcome that we're ultimately all looking for. But I think then to actually achieve that, you look at the technology side of things and pretty much everything that we're involved in now involves some form of cloud-based technology. Now, you need cloud technology because you can't do a lot of the things that you would want to do, particularly around data, um, without some of that scale and that advanced capabilities that you can get as a commodity off the shelf. You couldn't do a lot of the things historically because you would have to have huge capex budgets to try and set up the type of technology that we can now so easily access from public cloud services. So I think technology, yes, there's certainly elements of modernization from a cloud perspective, but it's right. also a key enabler. And then I think the last part is around mobility. So people are obviously at the heart of everything that, that businesses do. So I think the pandemic in particular has shown us that you can't necessarily rely on people coming into an office these days to actually get their work done or come into some standard place that you would just to have them be um, in oil and gas. Obviously, things are, are happening more remotely than they were in the past. So enabling mobility as part of that overall solution needs to be front and center as well. You can't do things in ways where you assume that people are going to be in one standard place anymore. You have to make sure that you can offer those services, offer the ability to people access data to make decisions in a secure and compliant manner, but do it from anywhere these days. So that's the three things that I think about, we think about, is how are we helping our customers become data driven? How are we enabling the technology platform to actually support that? And how do we make sure that people are able to access those data services, those applications, the platform in a secure and compliant uh, manner? So that's how we think about things and therefore we've shaped what we can offer as a business against those. But there's Very, probably lots of different things that people Yes, do. of course, that's of course. But that's your, your, your three main areas of focus. I'm going to see if we can manage to get uh, Paula back in with us, back into the fold, and then we'll finish off with yourself, uh, Greg. Paula, you're back. Can we hear Hi, you? I yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> my um, my computer okay. managed no to... Yep. We'll, we'll circle back in a few minutes. Um, okay. Just want to say hi to some people. Hi to Lola. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hi to Beth, uh, to Soman. Hi to Stuart Henderson. Good to have you with us today. Remember, we have this, uh, we have this lovely uh, um, uh, incentive today. Is that the word? A full, uh, a half-page advert or article in the November edition of OG uh, V Energy for the best comment or question to our guests. So uh, please jump in with those. I'll put that off. It's a bit of a distraction. And back to the chat. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, Greg, um, it seems as if we need some some solid foundations here. Is it is it all about solid data? Is that what we need? Is that the sort of foundation mark for all of this? I think it's a hugely important part of being able to make data-driven decisions mean you have to trust the data and you have to have the right data and you have to be assured about where it's came from. So historically, as SOR Group, particularly in the UK supporting our oil and gas customers, we've always been involved in making sure that those kind of data um, fundamentals are there fact you can trust data, the fact that you know how it's moved through the various applications to get to the point where someone's making decisions on it. So without that, 
without having the right lineage in place, without having the right governance around data in place, it becomes hard to then do the things you want to do with it. So yeah. actually getting that right, it enables you to do a lot. If you're bringing in, I don't know, some AI capabilities or some new applications, if you do that in such a way where you don't have trust in the data that you're using to make those decisions, it's difficult to get the value from it. Because what happens is you might do proof of concepts around certain things, but as soon as people try to make decisions based on what you're presenting to them and they question it, you lose trust and you lose that ability to have the faith that you're going to drive decisions. So that's why we spend so much time and so much effort in making sure that we we get that right. And in oil and gas, we're involved in a whole range of things. We're involved in making sure subsurface data is quality assured and it's trusted and it's managed properly. We look at engineering data, make sure that when people are looking at putting digital twins in place, we can get the data set in the right format and, and trusted to support that, as well as looking at the wider corporate um, data management landscape and making sure that from a security and compliance perspective, um, you've got control and management of that. So we think that's fundamental to allow you to then genuinely drive your business through data. Love that. Thank you very much. Um, we got we got the end of the ambition level for Acker BP, Paula. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, what I was going to ask you was to be the leading EMP provider uh, in uh, from a digital perspective. Um, it's an off-piece question, but I was just thinking about it. Does that have any impact on the progress of supply chain catching up with you? Yes. <clears throat> yes, it does, actually. And I think one of the areas where we're innovating so much now is around uh, our large greenfield project which is the Nawaka project and there it's very much around the supply chain so we're bringing on um, a lot of say um, kind of smart maintenance uh, contracts you know predictive uh, contracts with the sub suppliers and really driving towards a paperless kind of uh, project execution so that we can have uh, data instead of documents delivered to us when we're going to press the start button so I think it's it, and, and I think it's a really good point as well Eric, because it's really, it's not just about like what RKBP needs to do to be digital, but it is the whole supply chain around us as well. And also we're very keen to support suppliers who want to expand um, kind of their offerings into the digital sphere as well. So kind of using RKBP as like a first mover, but then taking it out kind of broader to the market. Um, because I think all of us benefit when more than one company is using this, the services or the products of, of the supplier network. Very good, very good. Um, the, the next question that I had for you was um, in terms of top priorities over the next sort of uh, foreseeable horizon. What's what's the focus area? What's the top priorities for you guys? Um, yeah, I think uh, prioritization actually is the top priority. <laughs> 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 to be perfectly frank, um, I think what you find in um, kind of companies like ours, which is really full of, you know, like like kind of brilliantly innovative minds and, and fantastic kind of engineering acumen is that there's a great desire to, uh, to to start initiatives and to get initiatives up and going. So I think for us, it's really a prioritization now going forward and making sure that we are really kind of driving hard after, after value, because I think that's where the industry uh, overall really needs to step up. You know, we need to really see like a st stronger value outtake from what we're doing in digital transformation. And um, so for me, that's one of the key things, key things to work on. And then also, you know, really kind of drawing straight lines between what we're doing and, and the company strategy, which is which is not so difficult in AkaVP, I have to say, because the strategy is very clear and it's it is underpinned by digital, among other things. Very good. Very good indeed. And um, before we go to uh, Karen, I have a question. A lovely question from Gary Hicken. With so many companies and systems producing data in different formats via different protocols, how do we ensure that the data can be easily consumed and integrated to support the digital innovation we need? Who wants to grab that? <laughs> I'm happy to at once. Yeah, I mean, I think the a lot of the work we do is around data standards, around data governance as well. Um, so obviously there is there's industry wide initiatives like OSDU for example um, yeah. we're heavily involved in as sort. I don't think this is an easy thing to to necessarily solve. I think we we've been chipping away at this for a long time. I think OSDU seems to have good traction, but you go beyond that and you go into it's very difficult to try and get all the supply chain to actually adhere to those set of standards. So what what you have to be able to do 
is is bring the different data sets from all those applications together and do that in a way where you aren't necessarily building what people would na- call data warehouses in the past. It's very much moving to that sort of data mesh culture and, and actually dealing with just the data that you need to make decisions. So it's hard if you try and tackle data standards end to end, if you chip away at it iteratively and bring together the data you need. I think OSDU will be a big part of that, but I think it's also a mindset of how you tackle, actually transforming areas of your business. I think doing it iteratively and tackling genuine pain points within the business and just tackling that and getting the value back to the business quickly, you can start to to make a dent in that. Very good. Uh, We'll come back to our audience questions and there's some crackers coming in, including the longest question ever written on a live stream from (laughs) Steve Higgin. Uh, We'll come back to that. It looks like a cracker. Um, Karen, thanks for sitting there waiting patiently. Uh, Director of Digital Technology at Opportunity Northeast. Um, Could you start with, just for the people who don't know, who might be in other countries or maybe not in this area, uh, giving us a bit of a summary on the purpose and kind of focus of Opportunity Northeast today? Yeah, absolutely. So Opportunity Sector Enterprise Company, and actually in terms of geography, it's the northeast of Scotland we're talking about. Quite often people think I'm talking about the northeast of England, but we're, you know, like SWORD, we're up in the northeast of um, Scotland, um, headquartered in Aberdeen, the place to be for for energy sector, really, in in the UK. Um, And we were 2015, and we're funded initially through ideas that we use that money to lever in um, resources and funding from other bodies, whether that's national governments, whether that's other organisations across the UK to build programs, to um, encourage startups, to really drive the entrepreneurial kind of culture and spirit in the northeast of Scotland. But it's all about really supporting the economy and, um, you know, that just transition. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Now, your your role, Director of Digital Technology, puts you completely immersed in the in the topic of this month. Um, could you talk us through how we're accelerating digital transformation, um, not and you know in brackets, not digitization. Um, talk us through how that that's accelerating as you see it. Yeah, sorry, that was me saying not digitization. Um, people often get the two things mixed up, and they're quite different. And I think that's kind of something where they're quite used to digitizing information and services, whereas I think we've we've talked about we're talking about something large. Value. Um, so in one, we've got a number of key sectors. So I lead, you know, digital tech, and I've got colleagues who work across food and drink and to agriculture. And and really, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to grow a community of really um, successful, hopeful, hopefully unicorns, you know, successful um, in the northeast of Scotland. And and what we're trying to do is encourage those tech businesses to not just innovate and grow their organisations, but to actually work with other successful, larger organisations in the Northeast. So for instance, one of my roles will be to um, encourage other sectors to kind of go digital, to kind of um, join our digital transformation programmes and work with some of our really agile startups and, and, and younger companies who've got some great solutions and ideas out there. Very good. What are, um, what are some part of, of the, the work? Yeah, sorry, carry on. I'm just going to say, and part of the work is, is through programs like Energy Tech that some people who are on this um, call today might might know about or that might have participated. Um, participants. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, what are some of the key challenges or barriers to the kind of acceleration that we are we are we are we're expecting? What what do you see as as challenging or barriers to acceptance or acceleration? Yeah, well, it's not the tech, you know, I think um, both Greg and I have talked about, you know, how, you know, we've got cloud question talks about low code or no code solutions. And, you know, we've got lots of tech, we've got lots of fantastic companies out there. Um, and I think increasingly organisations understand that they need to have clear digital strategies and, and have data strategies. So I think we're getting there. And I think probably Greg's talked about that a little bit too. But for me, I think there's Still a bit of a gap in terms of you know right. digital transformation is like this you've got to have the right digital mindset um, and I sometimes wonder if um, some of the leaders 
maybe this is probably controversial perhaps just don't have that you know many of our leaders um aren't digital native you know so i think sometimes this stuff's more difficult for them um and that can be a barrier you know um for people to understand the values and understand what's required and do, does that mindset really lead to uh maybe a re reluctance to share data that would be helpful for all of this absolutely i think data sharing's huge um you know a great whole idea about i think um i mentioned before about cooperation the idea you know that some of the big challenges out there are only going to be solved if industry players get together and share them. you can still be a competitor and you can still share share data you know um but i think also that's my word, word of the month that's a beauty. I know. I, I know, I, I love it. I always introduce it into most presentations I've done. So apologies <laughs> if you have heard me talk about it. But it's That's actually brilliant. a word that, that came from life sciences originally, you know, where you get big multinational drug companies who work together, like maybe Pfizer and Bio BioNTech, you know, in COVID. And that's a great example of cooperation where it benefited both of them to collaborate. Challenges, you know, for the energy sector and oil and gas where you know sharing data working together you know it, it's some game here there's benefits for for everybody in collaborating but i think you know unless you know sometimes some of that lack of leadership can result in just things happening quite slowly you know pace is quite important in terms of digital innovation very good very good we've got some uh, questions coming in from our our uh fantastic viewers um i think that uh what you just mentioned there we've we've heard about data um after from uh, from ross afternoon all what does the panel see as the main barriers to rapid digital transformation most of the grumps i hear is the lack of access to timely and accurate data which i think all of you have kind of touched upon um there's one coming in here from from uh steve i might actually can put up some of it Everyone is driving a digital transformation agenda and as a consequence, there's a real challenge across industries about uh, sourcing skilled resources. Um, we don't see all of the question on the screen, but I'll read it out from here. Um, uh, Organisations like Tesco, AA, Thrifty, NHS are utilising no code to accelerate their digital transformation and core critical systems. Um, historically, it's been slow to look on the outside for other industries. So it's a question about... Uh, about um, skills. Uh, Karen, any views on skills and, and skills moving forward to support all of this acceleration? Yeah, I think it'd be fair to say that, you know, we have a skills gap in the UK. Um, I'm sure Greg will have a view on this too. But, you know, there are lots of um, unfilled posts. I think um, I read something recently said about 64,000 where we're going kind of unfilled at the moment. Um, but I, I think there is a general consensus that it's not just about filling these kind of professional posts, but there's a need for the workforce in the UK to kind of upskill and for us to have better sort of digital and data skills throughout. So, you know, I, I'm a great believer in the idea that everybody needs to be a to be competent around digital and data. So we need better digital and data workers, as well as having digital and data professionals like maybe data scientists and software. Um, but, you know, I think the, the question was, was around sort of um, no code and local. You know, these platforms are going to facilitate um, people to be able to do things without the need for professional developers, you know. So it may be that going forward, you know, you can upskill some of your workforce and, um, you know, get a slightly di different balance. But, but you know, there is a gap. Um, it's something an opportunity in North East that we're trying to focus on. We're trying to focus on where I'm looking at providing opportunities for people to change but yeah we we don't we have a mismatch definitely at the moment between supply and demand very good um please get in touch greg anderson sword group uh karen o'hanlon opportunity northeast and paula doyle ucker bp it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you today slight techie challenges but we got through them uh, and thank you for all your questions to our headline panel um an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you we will see you again thank you so much Thank Thanks you. Again. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Um, that's us. Um, we are now moving on to our industry spotlight section. Um, this is where we speak to companies that are deep into the sharp end of actually delivering on uh, projects and, and business related to this. Um, I'm going to bring on Paul George, 
um, digital transformation leader at TAP, Richard Thompson, data scientist at Imrand, and Gregor Deans, VP of Customer Success at FutureOn. Uh, if I can just get over here, there's Richard. Hi, Richard. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. How are you? Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, here is Paul. Welcome, Paul. Hi there. Uh, we don't have your audio. Oh. oh, we do. We do. I think it's just got a wee bit of a delay. That's good. Yeah, I think, I think it's there. It might come. It might come good. It'll catch up. It'll catch up. And uh, Greg Deans, good to have you with us. How are you doing, Greg? Hi, Eric. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thanks for being with us today. Um, Paul, if we can just do a little audio check. Can we hear you? I don't know if we can hear you perfectly. Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Is that a working? Table. Can There's a wee bit okay? of a delay with your... I tell you what, it normally settles after a few minutes. Let's go to Richard first, and then we'll come back to you towards the end, if that's okay. Um, but thanks for joining us all the same. Richard, um, tell us, for those who don't know, uh, tell us what Imrand are all about and what your focus is at the moment, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Imrand are a, a, a fast-growing asset integrity management consult uh, consultancy. Uh, we've got clients in the UK and uh, across the world. Um, we are uh, integrity management providers for a number of UK operators. And uh, we, we specialize in technology and data-driven integrity solutions for the industry. Um, Very good. I, Very good. That's it in a nutshell, right? Fantastic. Well, yeah. um, what are the challenges? We've heard about data being the solid foundation for all of this data, uh, digital transformation. Um Extracting data, what are the challenges around that? Yeah, um, well, data extraction is a, an interesting topic. I'd say the kind of main challenges that people face with it are probably the quality of the, the kind of uh, reports and, right. and where that data is currently held. It's usually stored in reports. It might be within text, um, written text format, for example not things that are easy to extract, or it could be the quality of the, the reports themselves. Uh, we work in a, an industry which has a lot of legacy data, so we've got a lot of old scanned documentation. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of challenges around that and in, in extracting the data in uh, into a format that's that's compre comprehensible, you know. Very good. Um, on the on the the as as the world moves towards digital and we get deeper and deeper into that, the whole idea of data science um, and people who potentially want to get into data science, are there upskilling opportunities that you're aware of? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm kind of uh, on one of those upskilling <laughs> things just now. I'm I'm currently studying data science as a graduate apprenticeship at Robert Gordon's uh, University. Uh, it's, a, it's a degree type where you're a attending tutorials and, and doing coursework, uh, but also applying it to the job. So you've got a workplace mentor, you you tie in the, the modules to, to what it is you're, you're doing at work and you're able to kind of upskill up for, for free um, a member of staff and get given to a, a good level of education on, on one of these topics, you know. Very good, very good. Um, the whole idea of using new skills and technologies uh, to apply a, a, a different approach to extracting data, what are the challenges to that? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of recent advances in, in data extraction. Um, some of the challenges that I mentioned before with um, kind of inconsistencies in, in data format um, and the quality of the data. Um, so previously, there was a lot of challenges around uh, OCR and what you could actually get get out of get out of a, a poorly scanned report, or or generally just older formats of, of documents. Trying to get get the data out in into something compre comprehensive, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But but recently, there's been a, a good few advances, especially with with AI techniques, and um, being able to extract table data from from kind of reports where it was previously uh, not possible to get that data out of there, um, and there's not there's not I would say one solution, one program out there that just takes care of all of these things. Um, I'd say one of the the um, 
advances in upskilling a person to understand how to use these technologies as being able to use a variety of different tools to to try and get what you're after. How very good, very good. Thank you very much for that. We'll uh, we'll we'll hopefully circle back and uh, maybe grab you for one of the questions coming in from our audience today. Um, for now, if, thank you for that, uh, Richard and um, Paul. Um, your your title, just as you were about to take a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Now you've got you've got it in your title, digital transformation leader at TAP. Um, can you tell us um, and remind us uh, for those who for those who don't know what TAP are focusing on and what you guys do? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, can you hear me okay now? Is that better to speak? It's a little bit. It's a little bit crackled. Are you guys the same? Can you hear him as a little bit crackled, or is it just me? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. But I'll look, it might I'll be a good to thing to do is is yeah just nip out close down all your applications and come back in and join us sometimes if you've got like word or anything else open if you yeah. nip out and come back in i'll nip yeah. over to greg just now and we'll hear from greg and if you close everything down and come back in and join us we'll try again okay. all righty happens sometimes we've just got to roll with the punches on these lives greg you're you're on you're on the floor earlier than you expected uh, good to have you with us um what are the biggest barriers that you guys see? I mean, you guys are at Future On, so just a reminder of what you guys, what you guys at Future On are doing. Yeah, so thanks for the invite, yeah. uh, Eric. So, with, uh, we have a product called Field Twin. So it's basically my, my son calls it Minecraft for years. But basically, you can quickly <laughs> create, uh, drag and drop your field and or wind farm, or or hydrogen plant. So you're creating offshore fields that bring in bathymetry data and technical data. So it's a sort of one, so a one sort of front end or visualization. So it's a three D tool where you can view your field, but it's got technical data supporting. So you can from it you can route your pipeline and then run a flow assurance calculation with an external tool, or add some manifolds and wells and then run a costing analysis on it. So it's a sort of development and design tool for for offshore fields. Very good, and and in terms of, I mean, that sounds like uh, an absolute benefit to organisations. But are there any barriers to the adoption of things like Field Twin today? Yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but it's probably one probably one that's shared not just on on the supplier side, but on every side. It's um, you know the often the discussions there's always excitement about digital tools, and then someone asks for money to buy it from from our customer internally. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the the manager will ask, well, what's the value of it? Yeah. You know, how much time will I save, or uh, what what real benefit will it will it bring my project teams? Uh, and you know, you can't just say, well, you, you'll work better. You know, you have to really demonstrate that um, there's going to be a saving, and it could be efficiencies, it could be you know better decisions. It might it might mean you can do more uh, concept studies in a shorter time. Um, but it, it, that also, you know, there needs to be a trust from the customer and, and commitment, um, you know, to to go in and and you know buy licenses, try it, and and use it. So we've sort of had to deal with that, and it's it's been a good learning for us. So we we do a lot of trials, um, not proof of concepts, but basically we we go in and we we sit with a customer and say, listen, you know, we can show you uh, set it up. We, we give them access to the software and say, listen, we'll build, help you build your offshore field, you know, in, in Central North Sea or maybe a CCS project. We'll build it for you with your data. You can, you can, you can start to gain the value. Um, and we're lucky with, with the field twin platform, you can do, you can do these kind of things really quickly. So, you know, it, it's in a short time, people come back and will say, you know, there's, there is a value. I've, I've seen it already. So then, then Very that added. Good stuff. Um, the, the whole concept of there's an app for that, so it's going to make things easy and it's going to make your life better. Do you really think that operators and contractors that are implementing these digital platforms and applications are really realizing and and really feeling and seeing the value that they were promised? Um, yeah, that's a it's a difficult one to. There's a lot of disappointment, I think, in the digital world. Um, you know, <laughs> expectations are very high. Um, but often, you know, an enter a major enterprise digital transformation, you know, that's that's not something it's going to take take a couple of weeks to do. Um, and there's so there's individuals working away, and and I think these days when you speak to project teams working on on two jobs instead of one, so they, they want to see they want to see not just a nice digital tool, but they want to see something that will help them. 
So again, it maybe goes back to that last question. You know, for if we're speaking to a cost engineer or we're speaking to a flow assurance engineer, what can what can save him eight hours of of, of time a week? You know, it's it's integrating d digital data from different places within our tool, and then linking to his existing tools. You know, we're not going to force these guys to change uh, from Excel or from Olgar pipe sim or something else. So we we need to integrate the tools they use already. Sure. So that that's been the sort of change of approach. So we're we're now, well, we've always been so that integration focused where you you log in, but you can to the same tool as the drilling engineer, but as a flow assurance engineer, you can you can still do your normal job, but better. And do you see um, recruitment into this space as a challenge at the moment? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure everyone's sort of feeling the same. It's we've got a blessing in the curse at the moment. So we are we're expanding really quickly. We've got some fantastic customers uh, in our in our portfolio, and they but they all need good support. Um, you know, you need to do that to to ensure your digital tool is going to bring them value. Um, but we're lucky. I mean, they you know I mentioned Minecraft for for sub engineers, but you know in Aberdeen you've got lots of people with engineering backgrounds. You've got lots of technically curious people, and they want to use new technologies and they want to apply their experience to you know this new digital world um and from our side we need to show that people people joining can be part of this sort of innovation team they can suggest tools they can um, use the experience they've got to to bring on things um and we also want to be part of the community in aberdeen so you know supported by yourselves uh, net zero national subsea center you know there's an amazing community around uh, of very motivated people um, and we want to work with them as well. So there's there's um, a knowledge transfer, and uh, when it comes to recruitment, I think that that excites people, and people want to be part of that community. Very good. We're gonna we're gonna come back. Paul George has rejoined us just now. I think he might be on the phone. Um, we will try and get him back on, and hopefully the audio is working. If not, we'll jump to some questions from the audience. Paul, are you with us? I hope so. Is that? You sound clear as a bell. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. You <laughs> sound uh, there after prepping. <laughs> um, don't uh, worry, Paul. I, I answered all your questions. Yes, it's oh, okay. done. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it's gone crackly again, but we'll, we'll, we'll crack on for a little while. Um, can you just remind us what TAP is all about, what you guys do? Yeah, sure. So TAP stands for the Agile Applications Platform, and we provide a no-code local code application. Unfortunately, technology. unfortunately, the, the audio is gone again, Paul. Can you hear me? Unfortunately, now? it's gone. Yep. No, it's uh, it's, got a, it's got a, a crackle on it. Um, I don't know if it's just. Are you guys the same, Greg and Richard? Can you hear that crackle? Yeah, yeah. it's it's kind of inaudible. I think what we might have to do is put a pin in this with you, and I'll put pressure on Dan Highland, the producer of, sh of this show, to get you guys back on for a future show because you're owed a spot, but yeah. we can't hear you. So uh, we'll try again later, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, stay with us. Stay with us for a little while. I'm going to go to some questions from the audience. Cr cracking question uh, coming in here from uh, David Green. Do you, do you guys see any potential progress on digital data democracy? That is free access to data to allow third parties to develop new linkages and apps that cannot be produced inside a single organization. This has been pushed in the Singapore maritime sector. Uh, and he finishes off, but so far progress has been limited. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking I, at Greg, Greg and Richard here. Yeah. yeah I, I, don't, I'll, I will first, maybe Richard can can follow. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the democracy, and I think, um, you know, we talk about the socialization, which is almost making the connections between the data. Um, obviously, we, we have to respect there's, there's data um, governance uh, we have to respect. But we do see a lot more openness. Um, I think people are realizing that um, you know data isn't as, as as precious as it has to be. You know, we we one of our demo fields that we have in our field twin platform is the Vol field. So this is the field in Norway where Equinor actually made all the field data public for people really to to play with and test with. Um, and that's that kind of thing. That kind of approach is fantastic because if you're a small startup, you know, getting access to you know detailed uh, data on a, on a specific topic is, is very difficult. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I think it's it's one of these things that 
when I've attended a few uh, kind of uh, digitalization events, that it's, it's brought up at every single one, uh, people being able to kind of share their, their data a little bit more so we can kind of get that bigger picture uh, view of it and, and maybe have a, some data sets that are out there for people to freely use and, and develop from. Um, I, I think it's something that will probably progress slowly with it, it's getting people to kind of let go of their data is is a, a, a kind of a tough ask in, in a lot of cases. Um, but I think if we can kind of get a few big players on board to share some data and maybe create something with it, it can show the value of that of that kind of sharing um, sharing that data. Be, that could be a that could be of benefit. Oh, um, thank you. Oh, Eric, that. Gonna, yeah. I'm coming through clear now. You are? Right, I changed network. We've got two networks in the office, and I've changed it. <laughs> and if that's worked, that's brilliant. Well, that is brilliant, and and we are so chuffed that we've got you back. We've got a few minutes left. We're just going to give it to you. We're not going to go to those questions in the audience. We're going to give it to you, Paul. So yep. just a reminder of what is TAP all about. Yeah, so TAP stands for the Applications Platform. <laughs> <laughs> started again. Is it started again? Yeah. Oh. Afraid so. Afraid so. The, 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 the technical world is against us today. The right. technical world is against us today. We're gonna we're gonna put a pin in that. We will definitely have you back, Paul, because you've got some amazing stuff to tell us. Future show, Dan Highland's taking notes and he's done a thumbs up. We will get you back and we will sort this out. It's probably a problem at our end. All right. Okay. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, last question. Uh, it's a it's from LinkedIn user. If you can tell us who you are, LinkedIn user, I can send you a little fix for this so that we can see who you are. Um, how many companies have aligned their data transformation projects with enterprise strategy governance to not only realize the benefits from data transformation, but to help move their companies towards net zero compliance? Anybody want to grab that one? I'll let Richard go first. Oh, oh Richard. <laughs> so gracious. Put me on the spot. Sorry, I'm just trying to find it so I can read it again. So this whole thing about uh, aligning data transformation with enterprise strategy governance to not only realize the benefit of digital transformation, but actually to drive and move their companies towards net zero. Is that anything that you've been exposed to or that you're aware of? Um, purely on kind of the data transformation projects and the kind of benefits that, that you can see from that in, in accessing your kind of legacy data and how that can improve decision making. Um, I don't have any um, no specifics on that one. With, no, nothing specific, I'm afraid. So I guess that um, I'd love to know who you are, LinkedIn user. If you can send us a little note and tell us who you are, because that is a superb question, whereas net zero compliance would be the driver for digital transformation mm -hmm. rather than you know some of the other more known benefits. Yeah, I was going to add, um, Eric, I mean, we, we see we're involved in a lot of the sort of wind and energy transition projects. So we're, you know, our customers are now asking, you know, what if you build a wind farm field, how can we model it? How can we simulate? How can we estimate, you know, the energy balances and, and CO2 to, to build the field and also CO2 yeah. when, when operating? Um, there's a lack of data sets. There's a lack of data govern um, data standardization. And I think it's a bit, not maybe Wild West at the moment, but you know, a lot of companies are offering CO2 calculation tools and uh, really what's, what's behind that uh, isn't, isn't always clear. So I think it would be great to have maybe some of the, the industry groups, and I'm sure they're, they're moving towards that, to, um, to start to build these data sets that we can, or data models that we can all share and, and benefit from. Fantastic. Um, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to spend some time with you. I'm desperately sorry we didn't get a chance to hear from Paul at TAP. We will definitely come back uh, and recover that. Um, thank you for sharing your insight. Thank you for fielding those questions as well. And we will catch up with you guys later on. Please get in touch with Richard and, uh, and Greg for a chat to extend the conversation on digital transformation. Thank you very much, guys. See you later. Thanks, Thank you. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Very good. So we are now moving on to the market watch section of our show. Uh, we've had some feedback that this is uh, this is where everyone leaves the chat and goes on and starts taking notes about all the projects and all that that are coming. I'm going to welcome uh, Teresa Wilkie from uh, Research Director at Westwood Global Energy Group. Hello, Teresa. Good to have you with us. Hi, Eric. How are you doing? 
Uh, really well, thank you. Really well. Uh, and we have Neil Golding, who's got his camera turned off, but he's just put it back on uh, from uh, the Energy Industries Council. So good to see you both. Hi, Neil. How's things? Afternoon, Eric. Uh, all it's is good, good, thank you. Very good, very good. Um, now, you guys travel more than anyone I've ever met. You're always off in your travels. Are, uh, have you been centred in the one location for a wee while? Or are you abroad right now? Uh, I'm I'm at home. I'm working from home today. Um, I was in the Netherlands last week, and I'm in <laughs> Houston in two weeks. Um, it just goes on. Yeah, so I'm very lucky. It's great. And uh, you're no stranger to living out of a suitcase, are you, Neil? No, just back from Houston myself and Aberdeen last week, and then Rio in a week and a bit's time. My uh, goodness. So, yeah. International jet setting. Um, <laughs> Teresa, Teresa, it's good to have you back with us. You are an old hand at how to show slides, and I'm sure you've got a, a nice slide deck to show us, as a, as our, our good people from West would normally do. All right, hopefully you can see this. I can, and I will put that up for you. There you go. It's Perfect. all yours. All right. So um, every month, so for anyone who doesn't know, every month, Westwood Global Energy Group, we provide market data for OGVs, uh, OGV Energies magazine. So that covers offshore field development, drilling rig and wind sectors. And what page, gonna... uh, page, page 45 and 46 to be specific. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> You've been reading it. Good. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief update from the September issue, and that's uh, obviously provided by our expert analysts from each sector as well, from the company. So hopefully the slides are moving through okay. Oh, they are. They're perfect. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, just starting with the offshore wind market then. So since the last update, Siemens Gamesa signed a firm order to supply turbines for the 924 megawatt Sunrise Wind project, and that's offshore Massachusetts. And the company will supply a total of 84 turbines for the project. And then um, last month, sort of dominating the headlines in this side of things was the news that GE has been actually barred from selling its Halley ADX offshore wind turbines in the US by a federal judge in Boston. So uh, in June 2022, the judge ruled that the turbine model had actually infringed on Seaman Gamesa's offshore direct drive technology patents and that the ruling follows the initial judgment. Wow. So, um, yeah, so the judge has granted GE the rights to supply uh, those turbines to the 806 megawatt Vineyard One uh, project and the 1.1 gigawatt um, Ocean Winds One project. So GE will actually have to pay a royalty of 30,000 US dollars per megawatt of rated capacity for each of the turbines that it supplies to the Vineyard One project and a royalty rate for Ocean Wind One is still to be determined um, at a further hearing. So the same, and actually the, those same turbines um, were also selected for the 120 megawatt Skipjack One Wind Farm. However, um, a turbine supply exemption has not been granted for that project. A few sore heads on that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was a uh, big news uh, last month. And then um, also sort of lastly um, in the news for Taiwan, the Energy Bureau of the Ministry of Economic Affairs is planning to launch a floating wind demonstration tender. And that's in the fourth quarter of this year with the aim of selecting project developers in 2023. So the tender process is for a total installation capacity of 100 megawatts with a cap of 50 megawatts on any single project. And then just next up, looking at the offshore rig market then. So the global committed jack-up count dropped by three units to 382 in August. And the available jack-up count stands at 51, while there's still um, 53 cold stack jack-ups. Marketed committed utilisation dropped by 1% to 88% in the month. And seven new fixtures were recorded with a total of 17,141 drilling days, the majority of which, unsurprisingly, came from the Middle East. The global committed semi-sub count increased by 1 to 68 in August, and there are 14 available units and 14 cold stack rigs as well. Marketed committed utilisation declined from 85% to 83% during the month, and there were seven new fixtures with a total of 1,305 drilling days. Most notably, actually, was the um, AcroBP award uh, for a five-year contract for Oddfjell drilling semi-deep sea Stavanger to work offshore Norway, and that's not actually commencing until the first quarter of 2025. And then finally, on the drill ship side, drill ship demand continued to grow. 
uh, where the committed count increased by 1 to 76, leaving only five units available in the market, but with another 15 cold stacked. Marketed committed utilisation maintained at 94%. Four new contracts with a total of 3,452 drilling days were awarded in August. And then among those, Transocean was awarded a six-year contract for its Petrobras 10,000 drill ship with operations set to commence in the fourth quarter of 2023. Thank you. And then just finally looking at field development activity then. So during the period, uh, final investment decisions were announced for Harbour Energy's Talbot development in the UK, Shell's Rosemary Marjoram development in Malaysia and Total Energy's Phoenix Gas field offshore Argentina. Um, however, the EPC contract awards related to those developments are yet to be announced, um, contributing an anticipated spike in offshore related EPC activity in the fourth quarter of 2022. Offshore EPC award activity year to date is valued at 27 billion US dollars, driven by 160 subsea trees, 1900 kilometres of surf, 2150 kilometres of line pipe, 10 floating production systems and 56 fixed platforms. And an additional 42 billion US dollars in offshore EPC contract award value is forecast for the remainder of 2022. And now you can find an extended offshore market update in the latest issue of OGV magazine. So I think that's from everything from my side, Eric. I'll hand it back to you. Very good. I will take that off. But I do okay. want to pick up on uh, on something you mentioned. You mentioned um, uh, uh, a five-year contract award for a semi-submersible in Norway. Um, does that mean we see we can expect to see North Sea rig market uh, starting to get busier? Yeah, I think we've talked a little bit about that um, in the past, mainly because we find the North Sea rig market has been really lagging behind uh, a lot of the other regions um, globally, especially this year where things have really been picking up. But I would say actually over the past uh, month or two, we've seen some considerable uh, term awards for um, rigs, both in the UK and Norway. So things are starting to tighten up there a little bit. We do still see a little bit of um, sort of looseness in the market uh, start of next year because those contracts that are getting awarded, they're not starting now. You know, a lot of them, the, the, the start dates are are a little bit out in the future. But yet yeah, things are, are starting to look a bit busier. Um, again, um, you know, mentioning those, um, the sort of Norwegian tax incentives, that's definitely spurring things. Uh, we're seeing more operators in the UK moving ahead with their uh, plug and abandonment campaigns, which are all uh, pretty long term as well. So that's having a, a big impact on, on the market. And with, with those recent awards in the North Sea, day rates are starting to move up as well. So, you know, we, again, we've been seeing those sort of sitting um, or sort of stagnating for, for the past um, the past wee while. So we're, we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick in those now too. Yeah, I think I think we've even seen in the news um, rig day rates reaching over half a million dollars a day. Is this is this your outlook for the market too, from Westwood's perspective? Um, yeah, so... Uh, I think the, the highest day rate we've seen so far and um, since actually about 2012 is 440,000 a day. And that's a, that's a clean rate for a, a seventh generation drill, uh, drill ship in right. the US Gulf. So, um, uh, but we do know that there are contract options that are priced um, and they're within that 500,000 a day range. So um, certainly things are headed that way. Um, the market, especially for drill ships, is very, very tight. And to bring a, a rig out um, is very expensive, you know, out of um, cold stack, I should say. Very expensive, so that could um, push up the sort of contract economics there as well. Um, I think most analysts have been a little bit hesitant to say, yes, we're going to see them in 500,000. But um, I, I do think most of the indications are there that um, certainly they're, they're headed in that direction now. Yeah, um, for, for certain segments and in certain certain regions. But um, uh, yeah, I think we'll, we'll see some of those uh, really high rates coming up next year. Very good. If you've got any questions for Teresa or for Neil, pop them in the chat. These two always get away scot-free because everyone's always scribbling down all the amazing insight that you give us. Any questions for these guys while well, we've got them, please uh, please chuck them in the comments. Neil, always glad to have you, Director of Market Intelligence at uh, EIC. Uh, what's been going on, on in the world since we last spoke projects-wise? Yeah, it's um, kind of picking up on the, the theme Teresa's mentioned here. It's, it's, we've certainly seen a significant pickup in activity. 
um, across the globe and certainly in the upstream oil and gas sector and in fact uh, contributing the article for, for OGV uh, this last month was perhaps easier than it has been for the last 12 to 18 months to kind of it was actually a case of shortlisting projects that are moving forward as opposed to hunting this. down projects uh, yeah. which is great uh, and it really gives an indication that the way the market is going at the moment. And so we've seen some sizable discoveries that have been made, uh, and certainly since the last update that I've given. And Cyprus quite close to home, of course, East Med there. Uh, E&I making a significant gas, that gas discovery at Cronus 1. Uh, they've identified around about 2.5 TCF of gas that's currently in place, and they're looking at potentially two development options at the moment. Uh, however, there's going to be further appraisal uh, drilling that's going to happen uh, on that particular uh, discovery made. Uh, and then Suriname, uh, everyone's been very excited about what's happening in Guyana. Well, Suriname is now getting into the frame in terms of its discoveries. An Apache corporation there have discovered 34 meters of high quality uh, net pay um, through the drilling of its Baja 1 uh, well there. And, and then we, we come to the contracting activity and uh, uh, Teresa, you, you mentioned there the Phoenix field. Uh, in fact, that we just just this minute heard and recently heard that the the EPC has now been let for that particular project following the FID for it and this Rossetti Marino that has the EPC on that particular project. Um, and it's going to be their Milan office that's going to be delivering that particular uh, project as well. But again, closer to home, FIDs, other FIDs, and, and Teresa's touched upon a couple of the large ones, but in the Netherlands, uh, Ruby platform development as well has just reached FID uh, operated by one dias uh, that particular project as well so all in all where we had seen I, I guess a, a relatively slow start to the year we beginning to see the final investment decisions once more picking up uh, in the upstream sector and and these EPC contracts that have been out for bid for some time actually coming through as well so it just generally feels and everyone that we speak to is saying how busy they are uh, at the moment as well. Uh, and good busy, not good busy. things. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the flip side of all of this amazing new project data, you guys recently hosted a decommissioning event. Any yeah. news or insight uh, or any themes that you can share with our audience today um, in terms of opportunities for supply chain? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting event that the team ran out of Newcastle and it was a cross sector event and we, we work with the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority on that. And so first off, what's very clear is that there's a pipeline of opportunity and there's going to be some fairly sizable expenditure uh, across decommissioning overall, $2 billion per annum in the UK uh, alone in the upstream sector. And then you take into account the $3 billion per annum plus in the nuclear side of things. And we got offshore wind uh, that is set to be de decommissioned fairly soon, I guess. Uh, well, it's around the corner. Let's put it yeah. that way in terms of the UK. So it's going to be an ever growing opportunity. Uh, I, I think what came out of this was there are already being seen supply chain constraints. And it was something that I picked up on the last session as well. And the resource, it, we continue to find it difficult in finding people. But overall, it, it's, there's plenty of tendering exercises that are being seen at the moment. We're, we've seen some sizable awards made recently the US, uh, Gulf of Mexico, in particular, Australia. Uh, as well as in South, uh, as in, as well as in West Africa as well. Um, the great thing for the UK is we are generally considered as well. It was it became very apparent to uh, listening to DIT colleagues that were part of this that we are seen as a world leader in decommissioning uh, in the upstream sector. And for example, Asia Pacific is really looking for our expertise in helping deliver uh, decom projects in the in the future in Thailand. Malaysia and, and Indonesia are of all potentially uh, markets of, of opportunity there. Uh, and, and again, well, just finally, really new technology. It's, it's, it's going to have an innovation will continue to be needed to, to help improve efficiencies and to reduce costs uh, going forward. But this overall this is an in industry is predicting that anything over $200 billion of ABEX globally. Uh, on upstream oil and gas, it's, I guess it's difficult to know exactly the amount that's going to be spent and it's going to be dependent upon the oil and gas price, but it's a sizable global market that we're going to see uh, in the future. Well, this is one of the most positive and buoyant uh, updates you've given us for a long time from both of you. Um, uh, Neil, looking ahead, it sounds like 
you know, from what you're saying, the overall project outlook is fairly positive for the energy market. In your conversations and interactions with your members in the UK and further afield, um, how are they seeing uh, industries going forward into 2023? What's the outlook and the sort of sense and buzz? Yeah, but continue positivity. I think it's fair to say that there are some headwinds. Uh, first off, though, uh, some of the companies are seeing that there's pressures on their, their margins at the moment, and that's largely due to rising costs. I've mentioned the rise, uh, the resource constraints and the, the material and logistic issues that need to be resolved uh, for us to help deliver some of these major projects. But overall, the expectation is, is, is generally one of grow, growing revenue in, in the buoyant energy market. Uh, oil and gas activity is being seen by most as, as picking up new projects, not so much, but more so the asset rejuvenation and life extension work. There's, there's some sizable opportunities there. The mega projects, which have been relatively slow in moving forward over the last year, two years, uh, and certainly haven't been hit in final investment decision in the upstream sector, there is some expectation that large projects in Brazil, Guyana, UAE and Saudi, uh, these mega projects will move forward. The expectation is that bidding activity will continue to increase. Uh, Brazil, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, the Middle East in particular. And this excitement about what we're going to see, again, coming back to Sub-Saharan Africa in, in South Africa and Namibia uh, on the major discoveries that were made there, but also hope that there will be a restart of activity in Mozambique in 2023. What has been seen and the feedback we're getting is that there is further emphasis being placed on the ESG uh, criteria when it comes to procurement exercises. I think that's something that all supply chain companies certainly need to be aware of. And that's okay. coming down from the operators uh, and then through to the EPCs and then further down into the supply chain down thereafter. And those projects that we were seeing in hydrogen and carbon capture being announced there is going to be some progression towards final investment decisions during 2023 where the, the supply chain is fairly confident in that. We're already seeing pilot projects move forward. Uh, and there is the expectation that offshore wind will continue to see growth. So again, keeping on the positive theme there, it, it's just a, a, an exciting market. And, and let's face it, in the UK, we could do with some positive news right now. Totally, totally. And I just if you if you listen really closely towards our comments, you can hear all the yippies coming from the ESG specialists of what you just said there. So uh, um, thank you very much for that. Listen, as always, it's a pleasure. Um, this is something that we uh, we love doing on this show. And thank you so much for your, your insight and sharing your knowledge of what's going on. And we will catch up with you next time. Um, any questions for Teresa or Neil, get hold of them, find them on, uh, on LinkedIn, connect with them and chat away. Um, uh, thank you so much for now, and we'll catch up with you later on. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank See you. you. Bye bye. So we are coming towards the uh, final section of our show. Um, this is uh, we're calling this digital transformation in action, and uh, we're going to welcome on to the show Steve Roberts, interim head of Offshore Technology 4.0 at the Net Zero Technology Center. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Good. Thank you, Eric. Good to be it's with you. It's great. Uh, it's great to have you here. Fan fantastic. Um, for those for those who don't know anything about uh, the Net Zero Technology Center, can you just give us a little uh, the little thirty second elevator speech on what it is that you guys focus on and what you do? Sure. Yeah, we were set up as part of the Aberdeen City Regional Deal back in two thousand and seventeen. Uh, we've been set up to invest in technology uh, to uh, accelerate the energy transition. So we're government Thank you. funded. Um, and we invest in lots of different technologies. Uh, and on that, I was thrilled and uh, and rather jealous that you were down at the National Rob. How do you how do you even say it? Ro Robotarium. Robotarium. Yeah. Robotarium. Yeah. 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 So this is uh, yeah Strathclyde University and Edinburgh University opening uh, their Robotarium down in Edinburgh yesterday. Um, uh, a great event. Uh, lots of people there. Lots of robots. Yeah. And, uh, and we are looking forward to collaborating with them to develop robots for the offshore energy industry. Outstanding. So there was lots of um, there was lots of uh, displays and demos and all of that of what's happening. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, fantastic. Absolutely love it. Um, and we're even seeing um, uh, some of the OGV members posting uh, more and more of that sort of robot style uh, uh, equipment and mindset coming into regular shows that have been running for years. There's 
you know, we're seeing them all the time. Is that 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 the, the robot side of thing is is creeping into everything? Have these people never watched Terminator? <laughs> 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 um, so, so, um, and, and as part of your role, interim head of offshore technology four point oh. What does what does that mean? What what does that sure. mean? Uh, so, in the NZTC, we have what's called solution centres that focus on different things. I lead the one that's uh, focused on industrial four point zero technology, so digital based technologies, and we invest in three areas. Uh, one is uh, your remote operations, uh, so any digital technologies that enable things to be operated remotely to avoid humans in, in harmful places. Um, second area is uh, autonomous systems and robotics, so we just talked about robots. Yep. And that's anything that can automate uh, uh, the operations. And the third area is an enabling area, which is data, uh, digital and data architecture. So. How do you actually orchestrate all the underlying systems to to enable all of that to work? Very good, very good. We've heard from industry players today about um, business transformation. Um, is it is it fair to say that digital transformation must be at the heart of any sort of business plan or business transformation moving forward? In your view, absolutely. You look at lots of other industries, whether it's aerospace, uh, automotive. Retail finance, you know, digital has been at the heart of their transformations, and um, and it's no different for offshore offshore energy. Um, we've recently released a a report um, transitioning uh, to the green energy uh, environment, um, which will require lots of different technologies to be combined. And, and the report summarizes the opportunities in hydrogen, offshore wind carbon you know, um, capture and sequestration um, and all the different technology elements that, that need to be brought to bear to, to enable that to happen to support the energy transition. Um, and in that report, I mean, digital technologies are mentioned 32 times. So in that transition, there's Thank already you. recognition that digital technology uh, needs to be at the heart of it. Um, we spoke earlier and we were having a bit of a chat about the um, the OEDS task force report. In fact, I've got a little image of it. If I can, if I can bring it up just to show people what we are talking about, uh, it is this one right here. That's the one. Yeah. And if he wants to grab a copy of that, take a note of it. It's a fascinating read. Digital offshore energy systems from the offshore energy data strategy task force report. Um, take a note of that. Um, chaired by the North Sea Transition Authority. Um, there's a lovely, in the summary, it says, uh, digital technologies and data are, are powerful tools for the offshore energy sectors to address some of the issues, but they also represent wider opportunities to integrate across traditional silos. Um, and it talks about collaboration being super important. Inter and a beautiful phrase, interconnected digital ecosystems will create further opportunities for all. And I guess my question on that is, if interconnected digital ecosystems are that vital, who's leading the interconnection and where are we with it? Sure. Um, so that report was a collaboration of key stakeholders, as you say, led by the NSTA. And... Um, Great thing about it, it made some key recommendations, uh, three strategic ones and four sort of work stream ones. Um, and I always like reports that sort of point the way as to how do we get into action. So the four work stream ones are quite important. But um, uh, one, of the recommend, one of the strategic recommendations was the formation of a digital uh, strategy group. Um, and that has been formed. So the report came out in June and uh, the, the digital strategy group was formed and had its first meeting in, in September and we'll have another one in, in October. Um, so that group is formed of all the regulators for offshore energy, which I think is good because they have uh, an overview of what's going on and can therefore help lead and point the way forward on, on digital strategy. Um, Another uh, you know, recommendation that it that it made that report made was um, to actually understand uh, where we are on the digital maturity curve as an industry. So uh, it recommended another data and digital maturity survey. There was one carried out in two thousand and twenty, right. um, and I'm pleased to say that NZ, NZTC was one of the supporters of that, along with the other stakeholders, OE UK, NSTA again, etc., and catapults um and one digital um and that survey has been launched again this week so 
uh, but this time it's going across the whole energy sector. Last time it just focused on oil and gas. Right. So it'll do two things. One is it'll compare with the results of last time to see if we've moved forward as an industry. Uh, and then say that this time it, it'll cover the whole energy sector. So we'll start to get a, uh, a view on, on where we are as an integrated energy um, group uh, in our digital maturity. So it's asking questions about data strategy, digital strategies, skills, yep. digital skills, et cetera. Um, so that will be a, a key com component. Um, um, the report recommends establishment of data catalogs, common data toolkits. Um, follow, it would encourage companies to follow data best practices. And maybe we establish some sort of voluntary voluntary code um, to, to follow rather than regulators having to step in and you require us to. Um, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Um, so thank you for that. Please get a hold of that report uh, if you're in the if you're in the supply chain or in any way interested. In that's a fascinating read. And uh, and again, those uh, seven recommendations, the three strategic and the four work stream recommendations, are 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 worth looking at. Um, in terms of NZTC, um, word on the street is there's an open innovation program, a bit of a funding window, um, call for ideas to launch on the seventh of November. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, so we uh, have an open innovation program, uh, we call them funding windows, where we call for ideas on specific topics. So we had a call earlier in the year that focused on things like emissions reduction and, and energy system integration. We had a whole, over 150 ideas being submitted, so it's great to see that, that response. There's, there's no shortage of ideas out there. Um, and and our process then whittles that down to the to the credible ideas and the ones that industry supports so part of our process is that we make sure that industry are supporting these ideas and our funding model is a matched funding model so we can only invest to the degree that industry invest with us right. so um, we go through that process so there will be a second call and um, we uh, we will launch it uh, it's actually sometime in november uh, we and uh, It'll have quite a focus on digital this time. Um, and any any particular sub-focus within digital? Yeah, yeah, there's six sort of sub-themes that we've identified. Uh, one is integrated data solutions. So I think if you can integrate, integrate different types of data, you will get better analytical insights. Right. And, and there are products out there today that, that integrate different types of data, but you can always do more. And so we're... We, I, I, we get ideas in for more integration, so that will be one 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 theme. How can we integrate you know, video data with static data, with uh, operational data, to really um, you know, say gain the, the more analytical insights into how to operate businesses? So that's one theme. Uh, visual simulation. So so data can be quite complex sometimes, and the problem is mm. complex. So the more you can visualize that to help you know, uh, operation staff understand what's in the data, the information, and that therefore help them to take actions that are better. So, so a theme about visual and simulation. So can you simulate using data what might happen next to help guide decisions? Third area is just predictive automation. So um, we'd like to encourage industry to move along the, the sort of the axis of moving from just monitoring through data what's going on now to actually, you know, what's coming next? Can you predict what might happen next? Because if you can start to predict, then you can start to think about automating things as well. So a uh, theme about that. Um, fourth theme is, is what we're calling ultimate remote operations. And this is where we're trying to bring the space mindset to bear. So if you're in a space program, you have to design your system to be remotely operated. You cannot yeah. have a human into intervening somewhere in Mars. So you have that mindset right from the start. Okay, I'm going to remotely operate this. How do I do that? Um, this is probably more um, aimed towards renewables where they're creating new new assets. Um, oil and gas has the technology challenge of retrofitting uh, to aging assets. So it's, it's, it's more problematic. But um, I think it's a great challenge just to bring that space mindset to bear. How can we design things? that remotely operated from the start. And then two more themes. One is about uh, extended trials for today's robots. So there are already robots 
out there. But I think industry needs more confidence that they are reliable and they can repeat their tasks uh, you know, very well. So we're looking for uh, proposals for extended trials of today's robots. And then for tomorrow's robots, the last theme is about um, extending their capability. So yes, we're using robots to do some in inspections. Uh, and when I say robots, this is robots in the subsea, on platforms, or in the, in the air. Um, so we're already using them to, to do inspections uh, with cameras, etc. But uh, can they you know, turn valves, uh, press buttons, and, and move switches? Uh, rather than putting humans in, in harm's way. So ideas that, uh, uh, proposals that will extend the capability of robots, uh, we're very interested in. Fab. The key thing about all the proposals, although they're digitally focused, is we're looking for them to be applied to use cases. So they've got right. to be for a specific purpose. Um, and that's what gains industry's interest. If they know how it's going to be applied, uh, that, that's where their interest is, is peaked. Very good, very good. So you heard it here first, or, or maybe you didn't, maybe you're already involved in this, but if you haven't realised that this is going on, a good chance to get involved and uh, get your ideas tabled. Um, yeah, we'll uh, broadcast it as widely as we can, and uh, if yeah. you subscribe to our website, you'll get updates, etc. Uh, Phenomenal. Uh, just in closing, can you give us an, a bit of an idea of uh, some of the key digital projects, ETF digital projects that you guys are, are focused on at the moment? Yeah, yeah, we've got some funding from the Energy Transition Fund, uh, and we've got you know, four projects that uh, are funded out of that. One is uh, Data for Net Zero. Uh, this is our collaboration with uh, RGU and Aberdeen University, where we're, uh, they are um, collating lots of infrastructure data uh, aimed at sort of simulating whole system planning. So, so back to where we started, in integrated energy industry and the transition to Net Zero, that will need a lot of integrated planning. So this is a project which helps bring all that data together uh, and provide a simulation opportunity. Um, there's something called OIDA, which is offshore energy data architecture. So that's about the architecture, uh, creating some of these data catalogs and data sharing mechanisms, which will enable industry to share and collaborate. Um, we have a project called uh, Aero, which is advancing remote operations. I've already spoken about operations and we've got a project mm -hmm running to to sort of um, help encourage industry assess their assets suitability for uh, for remote operations and, and eventually bring a catalog of technologies that they can apply um and then the last one is is alter uh this is a light touch robotics um so this is a, all about our robotics program and encouraging and developing some uh, data hubs for operational data on robots to sort of help um, the operationalization of, of robotics uh, and the extension of robotics in the, in the offshore environment. So, so four key projects um, that uh, a number of companies are involved in already, but the, the door's always open to have more involvement, more support from industry. So if you're interested in any of those, please, please just let us know. Yeah, big time. Please do that. Um, uh, Steve Roberts at uh, Nash, uh, the the end, at Net Zero Technology Center, um, interim head of Offshore Technology 4.0. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and giving us some insight uh, into what's going on and and the fact that there's there's so many things that people can get in touch with you guys about for jumping on these funding calls uh, and jumping on uh, uh, some of the projects that you've got going on. Fantastic. Brilliant. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, we will catch up with you next time. See you later, Steve. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, we've uh, we've reached the end of the show. Uh, as we said that the right at the start, we um, we um, wanted to give out uh, a bit of a a bit of a prize for the best comment or question of the day. Uh, the production team have. Uh, chosen this one. It is uh, from Gary Hicken. With so many companies and systems producing data in different formats via differing proto protocols, how do we ensure the data can be easily consumed and integrated to support the digital innovation the way we need? Um, so congratulations, Gary. Dan Highland will be in touch with you to organise your free half-page advert or piece of editorial. Uh, congratulations, that's uh, good stuff. So yeah, we're at the end of the show. Um, thanks to all of our guests today for letting us have our window into their busy lives and sharing that insight with us. Thank you very much for, to you for joining us and all of your interaction with the show. 
Uh, and a final thanks to the show's producers, Dan Highland, and the show's designer, Ben Mackay. We look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday, October the 27th at 2pm, where the theme of OGV Energy magazine, and therefore the theme of this show, will be the hot topic of decommissioning. So if you're sitting out there and you're in that decommissioning space and you'd like to come on and share your views and share your uh, your 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 perspectives, get in touch with Dan Highland, Daniel Highland at uh, OGV and have a chat. Thank you so much for all of your time and input today and we will see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>